Thanks a million again, Nasa, for coming and joining us today. It's uh, it's great to, to get a chance to talk to you and uh, for the students to hear hear from you. Um, so I I might, if I may, if I can just embarrass you a bit to start, I was going to just read some of the things that were on your uh, your that I, I saw in your biography. BAFTA winning director, writer for film and television drama, double first from NCAD, masters in politics and aesthetics before completing your PhD in film at Trinity. You designed the logo for RTE, um, directed obviously BBC, Channel 4, Amazon, Netflix, and uh, you founded a creative design consultancy and launched the Big Story Small Screens initiative. Uh, initiative. Um, wh when do you sleep? <laughs> <laughs> Probably way too much. <laughs> <laughs> It's a it's a it's a very impressive, um, very impressive very CV. Kind of um, so what are you up to at the moment? You're in London. I'm in London. I'm filming an adaptation uh, for Amazon of a, a New York Times bestseller called The Power, which is a kind of grounded sci fi. Uh, and it has this kind of big global scale that tells the story of um, uh, weirdly something like a contagion. That, uh, that starts in Lagos, where uh, if you think of who are the most disenfranchised people that you can think of, maybe young black girls in Lagos, and uh, a few of them develop this ability to electrocute people with their fingertips. And it starts to spread across the world like a contagion. First of all, it's only young girls, and then it's young girls and older women. And the story kind of follows, and this, it's a big kind of Tolstoy scale story that follows this from its tiny beginnings to world transforming political, social, religious, uh, military movements. It goes into, you know, what, what would happen if, um, if young girls and young women had this power? You know, obviously it's, it's very much in the news here in the UK, uh, yeah. women uh, needing to be able to defend themselves. So it, it feels very kind of contemporary. Uh, and, uh, and yeah, it's uh, the novel is by Naomi Alderman. Um, and was, and was presumably then this was conceived pre uh pre it was purpose. conceived pre the event <laughs> <laughs> and it it's sort of the contagion metaphor is uh is is a little bit misleading actually because it, it is a contagion but it isn't an illness it's it's sort of transformative so yeah. it but then we look at it through four characters through the lens of you know what happens to trafficked women? What happens to women in in particularly oppressive countries like Saudi Arabia? What happens to uh, women who uh, you know, um, are already in um, political situations or women who are involved in crime and, and sort of tell those stories then uh, on a kind of big level. So scale. it's using this kind of sci-fi fantasy element to look at, at you know, political look, yeah, exactly. agency yeah. and all these sorts structures of things. Structures of power and, yeah. and how might structures of power change. And, and ultimately, it's, it's um, you know, it's not at all essentialist. It's kind of saying, look, people abuse power because they can. And it doesn't matter what sex you are, people will still uh, be because And um, when you're um, when you get involved in a project, I mean, are you always looking for some do you, for for a hook like that to get you interested? Do you know? Yeah, I mean, I, I know that uh, everybody who's listening here is uh, is a filmmaker. So um, you know, as you as you move through your career, uh, at, the, at the beginning, you know, you're you're just trying to get stuff made, right? That's just what you want to do, and it's like anybody who's willing to trust you with some money you'll do it to get stuff made. And then as, as things get, uh, as you get a little bit more established, people start offering you things and that's really nice. And, um, and the issue always is, well, what are the stories that, that I can tell? What are the stories that I connect with? Um, and I, <laughs> yeah, I know myself well enough at this advanced age that I feel like, well, what I, what I look for is something that has that kind of rich thematic subtext um, that has kind of something to say politically and, and socially, but that is saying it through the language of um, of some kind of concrete metaphor, whether that be grounded sci-fi or you know a political thriller or um, a historical drama or whatever. Um, and I, I tend to gravitate toward, towards thrillers. I tend to gravitate towards things that have a kind of action element to them. Sure, I, I want to come back and talk a little bit about how your career has has evolved, but. This is, I've just talked with, I've been having a few um, conversations with different filmmakers over the last, last few weeks. And, and this question has come up about, you know, as your career progresses and you shift from, you know, essentially to, yeah, <laughs> to choice and, and, um, and how your mindset changes and, and whether that's a difficult shift to make, do you know, 
um, just even knowing people who, who work um, freelance, you know, generally, it can be very hard to say no to things. And I think that's really true. And I think it is something that's that's quite an interesting gear shift, you know, that uh, that happens to, to every freelancer at some mm. point where uh, you have to move from feeling like you're in a kind of um, a field of scarcity into uh, taking taking the reins of your own uh, creative direction uh, a little bit more firmly in your hands and, and making choices that, that make sense for you. Um, and if you're lucky enough, you know, you do get to a position where you're uh, offered more things than you can credibly take on. And that's really hard. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm sure. Uh, all the things you want to do and can't. Yeah, that, that time becomes an issue. But uh, mm -hmm. I remember getting advice many years ago from um, the guy who, uh, who made a, a brilliant film called uh, Another Time, Another Place. And then he went on to make Il Postino and 1984 and a couple of other films. And he said to me, as a director, you should have about 10 films on your slate because everything takes longer than you think and everything is more complicated than you think. And if you don't have 10 films on your slate, you'll end up waiting. Uh, and that, that was quite good advice, I think. Um, sure. But it does mean that you're constantly feeling like you're slightly behind where you should be in terms <laughs> of what you're doing, what you're getting done. <laughs> I, I can certainly empathize with that. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, so will this be the first thing that you've shot since lockdown? Oh, so, but yeah, yeah, I, I kind of made a choice. I was lucky enough that um, I, was, I was filming uh, in the Middle East when lockdown happened and I was just days away from locking. So we went straight into the edit. So I spent a lot of the, the from March to October really editing, mm. um, which was brilliant. So I kind of didn't really notice the lockdown. <laughs> so I was having these conversations with, with lots of other people who were going, gosh, it's you know, so existentially challenging and so strange and I'm like, not really. Just sitting <laughs> in a room with an editor. <laughs> another day in an editing suite. <laughs> Yeah, lockdown syndrome. But um, then, yeah, so then I, I was lucky enough that I got commissioned to write a screenplay between September and Christmas. So this is the first time that I've been out. But I know there's been a lot of very successful production going on in Ireland. Like Vikings has been in motion. I know Ridley Scott's been filming. Uh, and it all seems to be going very well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. thankfully, absolutely. Um, so I might take you back then, if I may. Uh, uh, and to, 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 to think about how you got to this position of, of um, abundance. Uh, so you, that, you... That makes it sound very different from how it actually feels. Just <laughs> <so you> know. <laughs> well, we want to give people, you know... A, 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 there's hope, a, there's hope. Yeah, hope, exactly, <laughs> exactly. Um, you, uh, so you did, you studied in IADT, so you basically visual arts background. Uh, yeah, I studied in NCAD. So oh, I, NCAD, I started sorry. out, NCAD. yeah, I started out uh, in visual art and um, I... I not at all like your current students who are infinitely more educated and sophisticated than I was. Um, I, I didn't, I sort of knew I, I wanted a career in visual arts. I was very interested in storytelling and I was interested in, uh, I'd always been, you know, interested in writing and interested in analysis and interested in visual arts. I thought, well, I'll, I'll go to art college and then I can, you know, hold on to all of those things. And it was really only coming to the end of my, um, my, uh, degree in NCAD that I kind of woke up to the possibilities of film and video and um, I was lucky enough to win a scholarship to go and do that then in the University of the Arts in Berlin and there were two women teaching there one was uh, an artist called Valley Export and another was an artist called Rebecca Horn and they were both working in um, in experimental film and video and, and quite political experimental film and video and I got really involved in that and I ended up doing my master's degree in that um, and then uh, I got offered a job by Ortiz to work with them as a designer. So uh, that was sort of, um, that was in the early to mid nineties when um, the, the kind of CG revolution was just taking off. Sure. So I did a lot of music videos and title sequences and design work where I was kind of directing the, the, the material but the material was all incredibly visually driven. Mm. Um, and it was a good, it was a good learning curve for me because I was kind of coming in at the, at the beginning of the digital age. So I, I was very comfortable in that arena. Um, and I did a lot of design for T, like their logo and title sequences and, you know, idents and all that. And then after a couple of, uh, I think I did that for two or three years um, and uh, got to the point where I thought, OK, I, I feel really confident about my abilities uh, aesthetically and, you know, to make beautiful images and, and combine them with interesting uh, music. But ultimately, uh, which is something that your students already know, it's, it's not actually very satisfying if you're not generating story. 
Sure. Uh, so at that point, this was now in the mid nineties in Ireland. So the, the, the film board had been set up, I think five years at that point. Um, and they had never financed any women. <laughs> so I thought, okay, I'm gonna stay in RT and I'm gonna make documentaries because that's a way that I can hone my skills as a director. Yeah. So I, I made documentaries with RT for a couple of years then I did prime time investigates and arts documentaries and that kind of stuff. Um, and I learned a huge amount. And uh, I think it's Hitchcock who says, uh, when you make documentaries, God is the director. But when you make drama, the director is God. <laughs> hmm. <laughs> no, which one of those I prefer? Yeah. <laughs> uh, so it was, yeah, it was. it was a really useful learning experience. And um, Jesus Christ, you learn how to tell a story when all you can do is kind of observe, and then you have to construct it afterwards in the edit. Um, but I, I knew pretty quickly that uh, if I could possibly scramble into drama, that that was what I wanted to do. Really, yeah. And, and I mean, what do you learn? I mean, when you're, you know, the, there must be times, you know, when you're, when you're making a documentary where you're not seeing the story and you're thinking, how oh, Jesus Christ, shape? absolutely. Or you're trying to, you know, there's, it's a, it's a tricky, it's a tricky bargain that you make as a documentary maker because um, what you want to do is give some, the, a version of the truth as you see it. Mm. Um, and at the same time, you have to, it has to be interesting and exciting for the audience. And, you know, if you're in any way ethical, you're not going to try and construct anything. Everything has to kind of unfold and happen. Mm -hmm. So you have to shoot and shoot and shoot and shoot. So you write a script beforehand. Obviously, you do all your research and a lot of time yeah. you do audio interviews to get material uh, from people where they're a little bit more relaxed because there's no camera there. Um, and then you construct a narrative out of your research and your audio interviews to say, these are the areas where I want to film. These are the people I want to film with. This is what I want to see them doing. And these are the other images that I'm going to need. Um, and then you dive into that and it all starts to change under your hands. And you're like, whoa, Jesus Christ, what's happening? This isn't going the direction I thought at all. But obviously you stay with it and you keep filming and you keep recording. And then you end up with like way more material than you first intended because you've had to follow whatever story starts to unfold. And then you do, I, I don't know if people still do this. This is like, I'm, you know, back in the nineties, I would do a paper edit. Yeah. Where I would go through all the material, look at what I had um, and draw, write out on paper how I thought it was going to sit together. And then you bring that into the edit suite because the edit suite is the expensive part and, and, and you, uh, you cut it together in the edit. And even under your hand as you're cutting it, it starts to change again and you're kind of going, that paper edit is a bit too specific and I'm actually, you know, and it, and it starts to move again. But, um, but what you learn is, where's the spine of the story? How do I put turns into this story? Where does the audience get bored? Where do I need to cut back? Where does the audience not understand and I need to expand out? So that was really useful. And it was really useful to do that through Wartie. And I, I do recommend it for people who are interested in storytelling because everything you do goes on air. Yeah. And so everything you do, you're experimenting and trying things and, and you're getting audience response straight away. So that's both terrifying and brilliant. <laughs> but as a, as a kind of a training in your, engage, your ability to engage the audience and your ability to communicate with the audience, it, it is really valuable. Sure. But, um, but obviously, you know, dramas, it's the same kind of thing, but with a lot more control, which is- yeah, So you must've thought this is a breeze then when you, you, you went over to drama. Uh, it was, uh, it was a delight. Exactly I'll tell you what I did. What I did was I, I kind of took some time out. I left RTE because I thought there's nothing here. There's nothing that I can do here that's, that's going to work for me in terms of what I want. So, um, so I left and I wrote and directed for theater because I thought what I really need to know is how to work with actors. And, um, and again, you know, for, for young filmmakers starting out, I would really recommend it because it's um, that big, long rehearsal period mm -hmm. is a really great way to start working with actors and thinking about how they think and, and how to support them best and how to elicit quality performances. And I did some training in improv uh, in order to, to better understand how, uh, how to support actors on set. Um, and that was the point where I thought, actually that I could do this for the rest of my life and still be learning. So uh, I'm, 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 this, is where, this is where I want to live. This is where I want to be. Um, but I definitely didn't want to do any more theatre because uh, with all, I'm, I'm just in awe of theatre directors because it's uh, one night it's brilliant and the next night it's terrible. And the next night it's brilliant and then it's over. 
and you've no record and you're like <laughs> all that work and it's just it's like in a skip <laughs> it must be a, a yeah an experience of constant stress being a theater director you know because it, yeah. it never ends yeah and you know what they say theater is an actor's medium and and film is a director's medium and it's really true you know all you need to do in film is is capture that performance one time and you have it forever you've caught the lightning in a bottle and, uh, and that's really satisfying well and what did you i mean what were the those elements that you learned about working with, with actors that you you took to your film work because i mean you've you've worked with obviously a huge range from kids through to very established you know film and television performers um yeah is, you know, yeah so i've worked with i've worked with very inexperienced actors kids and uh, as you say uh, and young actors and I've worked with Tim Robbins and Christina Ricci and, and people who are kind of big global names. Mm. Um, and uh, essentially, you know, and, and I'm sure your, your students will know this. And what you're trying to do is you're trying to make, you're trying to elicit something authentic. Mm. Um, and it's, it's really valuable, I think, to be able to speak the actor's language in that respect. You know, not to be uh, what, what actors refer to as result direction. You know, can you cry here or can you look sad? Can you look frightened? That those are really unhelpful directions for actors and often result in bad acting mm. um, and that uh, it's it's much better if you can engage if you if what you want is, is a performance that feels exciting and thrilling and unexpected it's much better if you can engage with the actor near somewhere near the level that that they like to produce work from and everybody is different of course and every actor is different and they will want different things from you and part of your job is to to kind of feel that out with the actor but um, but it's to try and I, I think the, the first thing I learned was, OK, this is about relationships, actually. It's about one actor's relation to the other. So put in really simple terms, rather than can you look frightened? It's to turn to the other actor and go, can you frighten him? <laughs> <laughs> because actually, that's a much easier direction to follow. Uh, do you know what I mean? Than, than somebody trying to synthesize emotion, if that makes sense. So you're trying to give something external rather than internal, as it were. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And to, and to play the relationship all the time. So even if the other person isn't on camera, if they're actually delivering a big emotional charge, you'll feel it off the person on camera, which is what you want. Right. Mm -hmm. So that that was an early discovery that that has kind of driven a lot of uh, of my um, direction of actress since. That's great. Uh, and, it, and it is it is a useful way of, of thinking about it, I think, thinking about it as relational between the actors. I mean, your career is quite unique, really, amongst Irish filmmakers in that it's nearly all taken place outside of Ireland. I mean, obviously, you, you came back and directed Sea Fever, which we'll talk about in a little bit. But but yeah, you you quite quickly started working in in the UK and, and further afield. Um, yeah, I, yeah. I, it's an interesting thing, isn't it? And I, and I hope that it's different now. I mean, when I am... Um, when I left RTE, I, I felt myself, I was like 29 or 30 or something, and I felt myself to be kind of moderately established. You know, I knew my way around the business and, and I had good connections in, uh, in post and, uh, you know, people knew who I was. Um, but uh, it was just impossible to break into drama. And I think there were a couple of reasons for that. One was there was very little drama going on. So we're talking about the late, no, early 2000s. Mm. Um, so there's very little drama going on and um, and what drama there was interestingly was going to people who already had a very established career which i understand you know if you know if your company is only making one drama every five years who's going to risk a relatively unknown director and um, so it was it was necessary and it was it was i, I was going for things and I, and I wasn't even being kind of considered because i just didn't have the bulwark of a of a, a CV full of drama behind me, and um, so I was able to make short films, and that's fine. But at the time, I was thinking, God, I used to be paid for this, and now I'm making short films, and it's I feel like I'm I'm a student again. Yeah. And um, so uh, so I I went I came over to London, and um, and I met with a few agents, and um, and uh, the first person I met actually took me on, which was really lucky, and. Um, and she uh, basically introduced me to a whole lot of people. And, and the BBC were then immensely, immensely, immensely helpful because they just had a lot of drama going on. Yeah. Uh, so there were a lot of opportunities. And if you were smart and, and you know, as your students are, cine literate and, um, and able to, you know, engage in a conversation and not be too mad, like they would give you a shot. 
Uh, and so that it was a much more open um, field. Uh, and at the time, what I really noticed was there was a lot less, and I'm, and I'm sure it's different in Ireland now, but at the time, uh, this was in the, you know, kind of 2004, 2005, there was a lot less kind of um, rancor and, and um, you know, raw competitiveness between people looking for work because there was quite a lot of work going on. Sure. Uh, so that gave me a lot of opportunities, but I didn't really want to move away. I wanted to, I wanted to live in Ireland. So I just did this ridiculous thing of, um, you know, commuting, <laughs> working in London and, and living in Dublin. Um, and, and I'm kind of glad I did, because the other thing, of course, that, that, uh, that you know is for a career as a director, it's, it, it's kind of a gypsy life, you know. And even if a lot of the production that you're doing is, is funded and based out of L.A. or funded and based out of London, the chances are you're not going to be working there. So live where you want to live um, and be available. Uh, and uh, and you can work anywhere in the world. And if you look at, say, the career of somebody like Lenny Abrahamson versus the career of somebody like Neil Jordan, it was necessary for Neil Jordan to leave Ireland in order to, to be a global filmmaker, whereas it's not necessary for Lenny Abrahamson to leave Ireland to be a global filmmaker. And that's great. Yeah, absolutely. And I might talk in a little bit just about that, about, you know, how the relationship between, you know, Ireland and the global, um, you know, film and television industry has, has shifted but I mean going back to the BBC then I mean and I think it seems it's remarkable I think how often just being able to have a good conversation um is significant to people's careers develop you know yeah. as in going back to that thing about relationships and building relationships with people and yeah and it's was it, trust, I think. yeah exactly and so was the BBC was like was it a kind of scenario where you know once you've established that they you you are trustworthy that that then the work kept coming and and it happens quite quickly um for for anybody who's interested in that kind of career you know i i don't come from money so um one of the things i learned early on is a lot of people who just dive straight into feature film don't need to earn a living <laughs> so i want i needed to earn money and i wanted to be a director so i needed both of those things to be happening so um, TV was a route for me to do that. I wanted to be in drama. I wanted to, to work uh, in exciting um, storytelling, uh, but I couldn't afford to finance it without earning a living. So that was the way in for me. So I kind of really wanted to make feature films, but, but this is how I could, uh, I could direct drama. Um, and uh, the BBC were really helpful in that they'll give you a shot. And you know a lot of people will get a shot and then nothing will happen. But um, what you have to do is take that opportunity. Like I directed Holby City. Mm. You take that opportunity and go, I'm going to make this the best version of this drama that you've ever seen. Um, and you think about it really seriously, work really hard with the actors, all of whom are incredibly excited and really keen to do something great, right? Because they all want to use it as a springboard to something else. Yeah. Um, and uh, you make it really, really good. And if you do that, you never have to do Holby City again. Uh, and, you know, I'm not the only person that, the, that this works for. This is like, this totally works. Uh, and out of that, you get a more expensive drama. So I, in three steps, I went from Holby City to directing Happy Valley. Yeah. Because it's, it's as you say, it's a relationship of trust. So I did Holby, then I did one other, one other thing. Then I did, a, I did, I met Sally because I did um, a feminist detective show called Scott and Bailey. Mm. And then the BBC asked me, did I want to do Happy Valley? So, so if you can establish that you can, you're good, you can do the job, you're trustworthy, you don't, you know, you're not crazy on set, you don't bully people um, and you have a vision. Um, what you're doing is establishing trust with people who are looking to gamble their millions of quid on, the, on a drama and they want to know who can I give, you know, this 13 million pounds to that isn't gonna mess it up, that's gonna do it okay. And, and if you've already proved that you can do that on a smaller budget, they're more likely to give it to you. So it's, um, it's about building those relations of trust. And then really, you know, again, it's like, once you have those relations of trust and you prove you can do a good job, things change really quickly because I did two hours of Happy Valley and out of that, I got a, a Hollywood agent and a career in the US and I, I didn't work in the UK again then. So, you know, it can happen very, very quickly um, if you're willing to, to put your back into it and, and, um, and make every job that you do uh, as good as you can make it. And in terms of going into something like Holby City, which I'm sure must be like a well-oiled machine, um, how, how do you, 
actually bring your own vision, you know, to to something that, you know, obviously also has a formula that has to be followed, as it were. It, it is tricky. It's tricky stepping into the big machine and, and not everybody wants to do that. And I totally understand that. Um, you know, it's it's a way to start making your own work for sure. Um, because it's a way of saying, I know how to handle people and I know how to handle this material and make it sing. So you can trust me now to, to bring your money with me to my own work. Sure. Um, in, in terms of Holby, I think my, my big advice for people who are going to, who are interested in developing um, a reputation and uh, a, a, a set of relationships that you can bring with you into your own work is those things are very useful because people look at your CV going, you know how to command a big set because Holby is like 200 people. Um, and if you can command that and you can command the attention of, you know, very experienced uh, uh, um, character actors who really know what they're doing and will resist you if you're an idiot you know? <laughs> and are constantly trying to figure out if you are an idiot, uh, then it says a lot about you as a director. And I think the key to it is, I think, or the advice that I would give to anybody who's interested in that is, bring your whole self to the job. So, you know, analyze, you have, you have these skills because you're, you're at one of the premier master's programs uh, in, in uh, filmmaking. So analyze the script, look at its strengths and weaknesses, be honest with the script editor and the producer about what you think is working, what you think isn't working. You know, don't be a yes man, like don't, don't sort of feel that you have to do whatever they tell you and um, fight to make it as good as you can make it. And in that way, as long as you're doing it, you know, with with respect and not bullying people, um, everybody will understand that that you have a voice and you have a vision, and they will they will like you for it. And so that is, I was going to ask you the question of you know how do you walk onto these sets and and earn respect, but but would you say that's it? It's it's by showing that you have a perspective and it is it is one that is well thought through and that 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 you can. Defend. I think that's exactly right. I think you know actors and crew. Are, they're looking for you to show them that you know what you're doing and that that you can lead the way. And by that, I don't mean, I don't, I'm like I've seen um, inexperienced directors kind of try to be omniscient and, um, and shoot down anybody else's ideas and go, no, it's my way or the highway. And actually the really talented directors that I've seen don't do that. They don't, they're, they, they're incredibly collaborative. And the people that I've, really learned from and and uh, and whose work I really admire uh, are very open so they'll step onto the set going this is what I'm thinking uh, and this is how I feel this might work and they'll be very open to the actor going oh I really saw myself as standing up and walking over there you go okay let's try that so to keep it kind of open and fluid and um, engaged while at the same time being very clear yourself about what meaning you're trying to make um, but yeah, just allowing yourself to capitalize on everybody else's creative intelligence, I guess. Absolutely. And if you're if you have a vision, then you'll know ultimately whether this other idea works or doesn't work at, at the end of the day. I think you're I think that's really astute. I think you're absolutely right. Like um what was a cinematographer who said to me, um, you know, you're you're sort of a curator of ideas, right? Like everybody brings their ideas to you and you shuffle through them and you figure out the best ones that are gonna work together and then it all sings. And I think it's quite a nice way of thinking about it. And has your, I mean, have you learned over the years, has your way of interacting on set changed? Are you way, your way of approaching material as well in terms of, you know, pre-production and how you, how you plan and think about how you encounter a script, et cetera? Yeah, uh, quite a lot. Um, I think that, um, I, I think about it, I think there's a, we can go into that uh, if, um, if people are interested in, you know, what's the process whereby, yeah. You as a director encounter a script and, and take it from there uh, into post-production. Um, so if I if I get a, if I get offered a script, I'll read it sitting th in in one sitting. Um, and it was advice I got from the brilliant cinematographer Swabo uh, no not Zizek, uh, Swabo Mir Ijak, yeah. um, who uh, that's what that's our, our shared PhD history coming out there. <laughs> <laughs> if you mention Zizek, all of our students start to get a nervous twitch. There yeah, I can imagine. Yeah, I get a bit of a nervous twitch myself. So we'll, uh, we'll sidestep that elegantly. <laughs> Swavik Ijak is the man who shot all of Kieślowski's films. And he went on to be a big noise in, in Hollywood. But one of the things he said to me was, 
You never get a first read twice. Um, and his advice was, when somebody sends you a script, sit down, read it all the way through to the end, and then write down everything you're thinking. Uh, and it's a brilliant piece of advice because of course, that's how the audience is going to encounter it, right? Um, and you, you'll, you're amazed at how clear you are actually after a first read going, I was confused here, this didn't make sense. I love the idea, the underpinning seems to be this, the theme is that, don't really understand why this character is here. And, and those things, holding on to those notes is really valuable then because when you read it a second and third time, you kind of settle into it and you lose that a little bit. Mm. Um, so I would say definitely do that. Do use Swavex advice and do that. Um, and then uh, the next thing that you're going to do is send a set of notes back to the writer. If you're interested, you might read it and go, no. But if you're interested, you're going to send a set of notes back to the writer. Uh, and that will give you an idea of what kind of writer you're working with, because either they'll be open to that or they won't. Um, and you want to be open and collaborative and, and engaged in a conversation with them. And let's say that goes well and you get to the point where you're like, I love this script, I want to shoot it. So the next thing you're going to do is think about the everything in the scene is, is about meaning. Everything that you film has the audience will attach meaning to. So um, I remember, um, oh shit, what's his name? The man who made The English Patient. Oh, um, sorry. <laughs> um, I, 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 An English Italian man. Yeah. Him. <laughs> I think I, I think I've been able to answer that like before lockdown. It's uh, yeah. I'm, I know, yeah. So anyway, him. Anthony, he, he was Anthony. Anthony, yes. And yeah. he has a, Mingella. Mingella. There we go. We got Ooh. there. Anthony Mingella gave yeah. me a great piece of advice, which was uh, consider absolutely everything in your frame because the audience attaches meaning to everything in your frame. Um, and I think he's absolutely right. And where you place the camera has meaning, and what kind of room it is has meaning. And what colors are in the room, the audience will attach meaning to. So that's really interesting. That's kind of the fun of being a director, right? Is that you're, you're selecting and choosing to build a world and everything that you put into that world has meaning. So you're looking for locations and ideas and thoughts and references. And I, as soon as I know I'm gonna do something, I start collecting images because the more that, uh, that you think about it, the more you'll find images in your surroundings and, and in your encounters with other films and, and photographers and you know, your daily life, you'll find going, that's really good, that's a costume idea. Oh my God, that's, and, and all of those things will start to make a big collage uh, on your desk and on your walls and in your head. And then you can show that to other people going, here is the interior of my mind, here is what I'm thinking of. And it's massively helpful for the designer and the costume person uh, and the makeup person. And then you're looking for locations that will support that uh, all the time thinking about meaning. And when you have all your locations set, then um, I, I would favor the, uh, I think it's um, Eisenhower who said, uh, planning, uh, plans are completely useless, but planning is essential. <laughs> <laughs> And it's that idea that you sit down and you work out how you're going to shoot it in as much detail as you can going, I'm going to start the camera here and then I'm going to pull it over there. And then the actor's going to walk forward and it'll do this. And you have all that in your head. Um, and I, I would always share that with the cinematographer and I'd share it with the AD because they're thinking about where are we putting all the vans and where are we putting the lights and all of that. So you're, you're telling everybody all of your plans all the time and you'll walk it in advance and figure it all out. And then you'll get there on the day and the actor will go, I didn't actually see myself walking forward there. I had this idea that I'd, I'd stand back and cry and you go, oh, that's brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> and suddenly everything changes. Yeah. Um, and it's, that's, it, that's the eyes and air thing, right? It's like but planning is essential. But you structure to, to give yourself the freedom to change in a sense. Exactly right, yeah. That it forces you to interrogate every moment and every beat and figure out how you're gonna work it out. So that on the day you're free, yeah, that you can throw it all away because you know all those beats so well that you're able to, to think on your feet. Um, and then the old adage is really true. You know, you write the film three times, once when you write, once when you direct, and once when you cut. Um, and uh, editing is absolutely where it's at. It's like when you're shooting, it's like if you can make an analogy with writing a short story, when you're shooting, you're just collecting together every single word that you might want to use when you're writing that short story. And then that bucket of words is all you have. <laughs> <laughs> That's a terrifying thought. 
Uh, yeah. So, you know, you want to you want to leave yourself with some flexibility in case you decide to lean into another aspect of the story. <laughs> but at the same time, be kind of clear enough about what the main thrust of it is, that you definitely have the language that you need to tell the story that you want to tell. And the edit is, is really where it all happens. And the edit is the most exciting place to be. And it's the only part of filmmaking that is a completely, completely unique skill set. You know, everything else is rooted in an older technology, whether it be theater or photography or design or art or composing. But editing is a thing unto itself and it is unique to cinema and it is compelling. It's compelling. I think it's Kurosawa who said, the only reason I ever shoot anything is so I have something to edit. <laughs> and so you, you're you happy to get lost in, a, in an edit suite for weeks while the, the world shuts down around you. It's so true. You really can get lost in the edit. I'm sure everybody here has read um, In the Blink of an Eye, the Walter Murch book. Uh, yeah. And, and you know, the, what he talks about there, that notion of when people blink and whether you include the blink or don't include the blink and what, what kind of meaning that conjures. It's all really true. And it makes editing incredibly exciting that you can change the meaning really quickly by one small shift of just a couple of frames. So that's kind of thrilling. And then depending on what music you put on it, you know, it's, um, you can play against the scene or you can play with the scene or, you know, there's, there's a myriad of different storytelling opportunities that will completely change the work. Your, your answer was so thoughtful there that it makes me want to next ask you, the, the, I was going to save it for a little while, but in the midst of all this um, sort of success and, and you know, growing, um, uh, portfolio of work you decided to go and do a PhD in film <laughs> and uh, <laughs> so, uh, your question what the bloody hell were you thinking is that your question <laughs> no no I'm going to frame this I'm going to frame this very carefully um, so, <laughs> I want you to make the point I want you to I, I'm, I'm constantly trying to make the students the way that you know when students come and study film they study they they obviously learn the the practical aspects of, of you know how to point and shoot but also the 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 theory of film the history of film ways of thinking and um so i mean what ins what inspired you to to go and spend some time doing that and and has it informed your practice uh in the the last question first absolutely it in, it inflects and informs everything 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 that i do and i never made a better choice than to go and do a phd i think um it's really interesting what you say there and you put your finger on something really important when you say you know this your students are of course learning the craft skills associated with filmmaking um and the craft skills associated with filmmaking are what is the grammar of film you know what are the what are the shot sizes there's a lot of jargon in film as well you know so you need to be a little bit conversant with that so people think you know what you're doing but ultimately, you could learn that in a month. Like, it's not that complicated. Uh, and as a director, you know, the technology has uh, streamlined and simplified to such an extent that, you know, after, after a month of studying film, you can talk credibly to a cinematographer uh, and, and uh, to a gaffer and a best boy and, and the uh, grip and all of those people and sound like you know exactly what you're doing. And you would still have no idea of how to be a director. <laughs> so I think that the craft skills are, are relatively straightforward. But what, what distinguishes, um, or for me, or what I would argue, the directors that, that I admire, what distinguishes them from directors who maybe aren't as successful, is exactly what you've just talked about, is do you understand how to wield this language? Do you understand what, what emotional impact different forms of vocabulary in this language have on the audience? Do you understand how to subvert and reconfigure this language? And I think for me, um, going and doing a PhD was the difference between, you know, when you're, when you're working, uh, a lot of the time it becomes, how do we make this? How do we do it? How do we achieve this? And to have the opportunity while in the throes of that to step back and go, yeah, but why? Why are we doing this? What's the purpose? What's the reason behind it? Um, is incredibly valuable and something that is front and center of everything that I do now. And the, you know, and maybe it's just I'm inherently lazy and I needed the pressure to go and read the difficult books and go and, and do the difficult thinking about my own practice 
uh, and my own intentions and, uh, and how those fitted into a greater matrix of theory and thought and uh, culture and um, power structures uh, and what I wanted to do with that in a, and make that make what I wanted to do with that really conscious and um, that was really valuable for me and, and I would say anybody who's considering um, uh, a, a career uh, as a director I would really recommend holding on to that theoretical framework and developing it and thinking about it and pursuing it and nourishing it in yourself because I do think it inflects every decision that you make. Makes I it better kind of make. play that at the start of my modules every year, that, that, that last couple of sentences there. I mean, I, I studied, you know, I did a degree in, back in, in the 90s and that was a mix of theory and, and practice. And I think every student and every media film degree ever has said, we want to be doing more practice. And I remember us doing that and, and not understanding what, you know, we didn't see the, the kind of utility of the theory and it was only afterwards, and obviously, I mean, because it's my job now, but I realized, well, what had that theory done? And it was like, well, it had actually transformed every aspect of me. Um, you know, it made me think completely differently and think in ways that, and, and it happens, it happens suddenly and then all at once, you know? I, I really agree with you. I think it's really interesting that you experienced that. And I think, I, I think it's incredibly valuable. And like you say, you don't necessarily know how valuable it is until you have that suddenly and all at once moment and um, where you realize you've nourished yourself and you've furnished your mind with a much more expansive way of thinking about your work. Uh, and that's really valuable. And, and the thing about filmmaking is there are so many landmines and tropes and stereotypes and, uh, and people fall into them all the time, all the time. And the more that you can arm yourself with intelligence and insight and analysis and perspective, the less likely you are to, to fall into one of those terrible cinematic landmines that, you know, we're constantly pointing and laughing at in Hollywood cinema. Sure. Listen, I, I can't let this finish without, uh, my students will, will have me hung up if I don't ask you about Marvel and, and your experience yeah. of, <laughs> <laughs> uh, of, of working. Um, you know, making Jessica Jones and in humans, and and again stepping in, we talked about that well-oiled machine. I mean, that's that's some machine, I presume. Yeah, yeah. Well, Jessica Jones was a real pleasure. I I know the filmmaker. Um, the the woman who wrote it uh, is a woman called um, uh, <laughs> Melissa Melissa Rosenberg, uh, and um, she's a she's a a, a very thought out, educated person herself, um. And she has a degree in psychology. Uh, so she was kind of coming at it from that perspective. And together we were really clear about what we wanted to make, that we wanted to make a noir drama about uh, trauma um, and about overcoming trauma uh, that would also have a kind of wish fulfillment element because a lot of the times these kinds of stories, especially when they're told about women and women's trauma, uh, leave women in a position of great vulnerability and, uh, and the kind of enculturation that's produced is you know, this promulgation of the idea of victimhood. So we wanted to both make something that was uh, truthful and honest about the nature of trauma, but also that did not leave its protagonist in a victim space. And uh, I, think, I think Marvel were very generous in terms of giving us the space to do that. Um, I think that uh, it's very different from other Marvel shows in terms of the politics of it. Uh, you know, it's it's quite decidedly anti-vigilante um, and it's quite markedly feminist. Um, and that was real joy. It was real pleasure to make something that that had value for a big audience uh, that had that kind of big muscular storytelling in it, you know, where there's wish fulfillment and there's, you know, uh, uh, extraordinary events and you're you're in this pushed, quite gothic world. But at the same time, you're you're trying to you're trying to articulate a thematic underpinning that that touches on something that's that's a deeper truth. Sure. Yeah, and it was it's, it's such a fantastic series. Um, um, did you when you were you directed the season finale of of um, season three? Did you know that that finale, was finale? Yeah, yeah, we knew it was the end at that point. Yeah. And did uh, I mean, how, what was what was that like? Kind of bringing. You know, because because increasingly, you know, when we think about storytelling in that television landscape, 
it's about expansive worlds, you know, and, and often yeah. one of the challenges, you know, we see it with, with lots of series is, is, is about bringing that world to some sort of satisfying, satisfying um, conclusion. It's interesting, isn't it? It's, um, it's one of the things that's, uh, that's very difficult, I think, about, uh, about the television landscape. And it is changing, you know, a lot of the dramas that I did with the BBC were like that. They were like, this is six hours and we're done. Um, and you're getting more of that in, in, uh, in, the, in the streamers, the kind of uh, storytelling that you get on the streamers now, because it's obviously, I think it's more satisfying. Um, you know, that idea of, uh, of trying to tell a story that's ongoing is actually really hard because mm -hmm. trying, to, trying to hold on to your thematic subtext while generating that much story material can be, uh, can be quite a challenge. Um, and there are shows that do it, you know, uh, Breaking Bad is amazing. Um, and The Sopranos did it really well, but there were moments when those shows I think fell into slightly kind of soapy writing. So I think that's always the risk. Um, mm. And it's, it, it's more exciting to, uh, for me anyway, as a, as a director and storyteller, to tell a story that, that has a beginning and a middle and an end, where the end is, is transformative. Yeah. Um, and you kind of, you walk away from that story with this kind of thematic resonance that's still ringing in your ears like a gong. <laughs> and, and I think that's the difference between some, a story that's kind of never ending and a story that, that is structured to have a proper out. Sure. It must have been um, a great and, and a very different experience than coming back to make Sea Fever. Uh, you know, with, with something that, you know, you wrote, you directed, um, and uh, presumably, you know, is, is, was it quite a different production context with that, or scale, would that be fair to say? I think that would be fair to say. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, it's really interesting. You know, it's, um, it's, it's a very different experience. Like I knew I wanted to, you know, Jessica Jones being a, a benchmark and also Happy Valley, which is also a very pushed reality, quite a gothic reality. Mm. Uh, I knew I wanted to make something in that space where, you know, the thematic underpinnings are, are speaking to something quite honest and, and truthful and hopefully you know putting your finger on a sore spot culturally uh, but to use that kind of language and metaphor to do that uh, but to make the story feel very grounded and authentic and truthful at the same time and um, so I felt like I was kind of in that space and I'd, I'd done quite a lot of um, American production at that st at that stage which uh, it's it's really satisfying actually because one of the there are a couple of things that I learned from working the, with the Americans that I think I would like to share with those of us who are, who are working in Europe, uh, one of them is global ambition, uh, that there is an absolutely assumed global ambition in all the work. Um, and that's wonderful. I think that's wonderful. And they're not afraid of scale and they're not afraid of making big statements. And that's wonderful and very liberating. Um, and uh, I think they're not afraid of, um, of spending money, which is mm. obviously, you know, they have the money to spend, so that makes it easier. Sure. Um, Coming back to do Sea Fever, uh, you know, it was great. And, and I think that um, we achieved something remarkable with the, uh, like I'd, I'd been used to working at budgets of kind of 10 million an hour. And then we made Sea Fever for two and a half. So that was like, oh, okay. <laughs> so we can't have a helicopter. Okay. <laughs> um, is there, is so there that a was interesting. But of course the freedom that comes with that yeah. is really valuable. You know, I had nobody to answer to but myself. Um, and again, it's back to what we were talking about at the beginning. I think, you know, there are financiers who are investing in that film for a reason. They're investing in that film because they think you're going to make something that, you know, they can be proud of, but that also audiences will see. So I had nobody to answer to but myself, but, but also, you know, I, I wanted from myself to make a film that would be comprehensible and entertaining uh, and meaningful and that would uh, speak to a global audience. So um, that was all really important for me. And I think what, um, what I tried to do with Sea Fever uh, was um, I, I, met, I met Walter Salas at a film festival many years ago and um, uh, his kind of work, you know, you always say to people, so, um, so talk to me about your work and what are the things that, that, that you think about when you're working? And one of the things he said to me was, um, well, uh, spend your money on the emotional scenes mm. and don't spend your money anywhere else. And I really took that to heart then when it came to make Sea Fever going, okay, so the, the only places that we're gonna have um, big CG effects are places where there are big emotions in play. And when there are no big emotions in play, we're not gonna have any effects. Uh, so that the, the number of effects goes way down, but the audience really remember them 
because they're at these uh, key moments where the audience is, is primed to feel something. So that was a really good lesson that I, I yeah. learned from him and didn't then deploy for another 10 years. <laughs> <laughs> but it is a great piece of advice about, you know, you know, we're always talking about this relationship between story and spectacle and that, you know, and often there's this anxiety and you, you see it in kind of writing about film that uh, of the loss of spectacle or loss of story to spectacle. But, 100%, but that, yeah. 100%. Yeah, I think that's, that's beautifully, much more articulately put, that story and spectacle should never be in competition. Mm -hmm. And you know yourself when you're watching a film and it turns into spectacle and the story stops, you're like, yeah, yeah. You know, it's, it's interesting for like 10 seconds. Yeah. But actually, if there's no narrative tension, the story has stopped, the spectacle will die and it doesn't matter how much money you throw at it. It's the, it's the um, who's that guy who made Transformers? It's that, that uh, it's the criticism that's always leveled at him. Not incorrectly, in my view. Mm -hmm. um, that, uh, that the interest in spectacle outweighs the interest in narrative. But when you can marry those things together, and I, you know, for me, the quintessence of that is the film that is, very spectacular um, Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon, mm. which is, you know, full of effects and full of spectacle, but they are so carefully interwoven into the emotional transformations in that story. So the spectacle is always at its highest at, motion, at, at moments of true emotional transformation for those characters. And therefore you come away with those images burnt into your mind. Yeah, no, absolutely. Can I ask you just quickly, I mean, you, 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 know, you talked about a the difference maybe between working in America and, and the, just the, the way that people think in America about the scope and audience of, of their material. And also you talked about, you know, when you left Ireland, the limited opportunities, you know, the fact that, that you know, women filmmakers hadn't been funded by, by the film board, you know, which is you know, <laughs> unbelievable when we talk, when you say it now. I mean, do you has, it, has the, the landscape transformed in Ireland in terms of, access but and, and in terms of people an, an opportunity but also in terms of of how people see themselves and their work within that global context do you think i, I mean it, it, experientially just for me i i think it's i think it's the difference between night and day i think that um i think michael dean never did anything so brilliant for all of us than to set up the irish film board i think it's been it has been genuinely transformative um and, you know, I couldn't have made Sea Fever with that support of the Irish Film Board financially, but also artistically, um, that the Irish Film Board has also hired really able producers and, uh, and development people uh, who are proper co-producers, proper executive producers, proper collaborators in the process. And I think that's been great for me. And it's also been great for emerging filmmakers who are making shorts and making low budget features that, um, that there is that level of homegrown indigenous expertise there to reach underneath them and support them and lift the work to a higher level. And I think we're really reaping the benefits of that now, you know, 30 years on from the Irish Film Board uh, and, and uh, connected to that, Screen Skills Ireland, is absolutely world class in terms of the kind of training that they run. And I love the fact that they run that training on the basis that people are already working. Mm -hmm. And for anybody who's interested, you know, I think, you know, what, what you get from a university setting is what we were talking about earlier, Con, you know, the, the work that you do, which is that incredibly crucial nourishment of the intellectual imagination and of the analytical imagination. Uh, and of the socio-cultural imagination. And you cannot be a good filmmaker without that. You just can't. Um, and then what Screen Skills Ireland will offer you is we can give you short, sharp, incredibly directed and focused support with your skills, your craft skills as a screenwriter, as a director, as a script editor, as a cinematographer. Um, and they bring in the best in the business you know they bring in people who are absolutely at the top of their game globally because if you say to somebody will you just give us a week and we give you a nice place in ireland and, and and what they achieve and the people that they get it's 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 really something and so i would encourage everybody um who is interested you know they won't take you on unless you've already made a couple of shorts and you've already kind of established yourself as reasonably serious um but get your get your name on their lists because um they do this extraordinary craft-based support that, that is transformative as well. And, and that's been amazing for Ireland. 
No, you're right. Absolutely. It's, it's, it's great that we, we kind of have that infrastructure now around film production and media production. Um, listen, I, I, there's a couple of questions I've asked everybody and I'm conscious of time. Um, so just, just before I let you go, uh, that just to, to, again, one of the, the kind of great things about the, this is, is the students, despite, you know, obviously uh, their educational sort of experience has been diminished somewhat this year uh, for obvious reasons. But one of the great things is they've been given the, the chance to hear from people who are, you know, working at the top of the industry. And it's, I think it's just so valuable to get a sense of the reality of the job that you do. So with that in mind, there are two questions I've asked everyone, one of which is, um, could you describe a typical day in your job? And often the answer is no. <laughs> well, the lovely, lovely thing, you know, people say to you, being a director is the best job. It so is. <laughs> it absolutely is. It's brilliant. Um, and, and, you know, not unlike you, every day is different. Every day uh, contains different challenges and different um, uh, uh, duties and responsibilities. Uh, so today, for instance, um, I'm filming uh, the week after next. So this morning I was down, we're, we're it's, it's a grounded sci-fi, right? So we're saying it's happening in the present day, but we're also, we've, I've kind of decided, well, we're gonna say, we're gonna favor brutalist architecture in this show. So I was down at the South Bank and we were looking at, you know, the, the National Theater and the brutalist architecture there. And we were looking at um, the Royal Festival Hall and the brutal architect, brutalist architecture there. And we were selecting projects. So I was there, I got picked up at seven o'clock this morning. I got there at half seven. Um, I met the designer, the producer, the cinematographer and my first AD. And we walked around the space going, how could we hear the scenes? Here's the story. How can we tell the story in this space? And the, the designer was going, well, we can build you an extra wall here and we can, we can you know, close down the space this way. And the cinematographer is going, I can light up that building from the outside. And then when we look that way, we get this glow. So you're doing all that work with them. It's really exciting. I'm taking a big bucket load of photographs on Artemis so I can write it all up afterwards with visual notes going, this is what we said we're going to do. And uh, the producer is standing behind going, we're never going to be able to afford all this. <laughs> and um, then uh, at the end of that, I had uh, a script meeting with the producer where we looked at um, taking out uh, a couple of scenes that, that I just feel like they're, they're not really bearing the weight of the story and we can shift it differently. So we did that. And then straight after this, I'm having a meeting with costume uh, and we'll go through um, the, because of course, every character's transformation is expressed through how they present themselves to the world. So we want that to feel authentic, something that the audience doesn't quite realize that they're getting, but they're, they're getting story information through the way that this character is dressed in any given moment. Um, and then I have a meeting with, uh, with hair and makeup for the same reason. So we're, we're changing the actor, one of the actors wigs. So it goes from a darker shade to a slightly lighter shade as the story goes on. Again, it's something the audience probably won't read but they'll notice by the end of the story that that character looks a bit brighter. Um, so that kind of stuff, it's all kind of storytelling based, but you're, you're trying to share, here's what I think this story means all the time with everybody that you're working with. And then later on this evening, I'm gonna have a big long chat with them, um, with the executive producer uh, about the overall arc of the 10 hours of the story and, and um, you know, some little shifts that I want to make in that and, and how that will work. Uh, so that's not a typical day, but, a, but an average day. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> but it's, all, it's all great and you're working with you know you're always working with super creative people who are giving as much as they're as they're getting from you as much as you give them they're throwing other things back at you that are incredibly exciting and thrilling and you have to talk about yeah the most exciting thing that you say i mean obviously just other people at the moment sounds exciting but just that idea of of you know of bouncing ideas off people like that it just sounds so so dynamic and, and it always gets better right yeah because yeah, you're always just uh, proving ideas with other people last question what qualities do you need to do your job? Oh, that's a brilliant question. Um, so it's obviously, it's very hard to say this without sounding like I'm going, I'm marvelous, actually. <laughs> Does I'm marvelous. One need? Never do this, I'm marvelous. Um, so I would say a couple of things. What are the things, what are the things that you might want to learn? Maybe, can I phrase it that way? What are the things that are useful to know? Um, so there are a couple of things. There's how can I put this succinctly? In order to be a good director, it's, um, or this is my view, um, it's a delicate balance between being really firm in your vision and your ideas and able to negotiate and compromise. Um, because you are only as good as the people that will follow you. 
where you want to go and you want them to follow you. You don't want to be forcing them and pushing them. And I think heretofore there has been an illusion that a fraught and angry set produces good work. And actually the antithesis is true. You want, you want to run a set that is focused and calm and playful, uh, but focused on the work. Because if you've got that nice balance of calm and playfulness, people will offer you things. If, you're, if you have a reputation for shouting and raging and giving out, nobody will offer you anything. So I think it's very important to be a, to be a leader to whom people offer things. Um, and that doesn't mean that you're not firm and you're not clear and you don't uh, correct course with people who are going, of course, you have to be able to do that quickly and efficiently. But at the same time, uh, you have to be, uh, you have to allow other people's creativity uh, to come to you. That's fantastic. I can think of no better way of wrapping up. Nasa, thanks so much. You're so generous. I mean, given how busy your day is, you're so generous to give us an hour of it. Uh, I a great hope pleasure. Great pleasure. And listen, best of luck to all of the students and, um, and best of luck to you. And I hope to see you in person before too long. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, and, and best of luck with the, with the, with the shoes. And with the oh, thank you. Yeah. Fingers crossed nobody comes down with COVID. We're being tested every day, every day. So hopefully that'll, that'll stave it off. Yeah. Well, listen. That's, that was brilliant. Thanks so much. Really appreciate it and look forward to seeing you in the flesh soon. Okay. Take care. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.